and welcome everyone to another fantastic episode of RFRX. My name is Eric Wells and I am the support group director for Recovering from Religion and with me co-hosting today, you've seen her before, you know just how awesome she is, Helen Green, an ambassador and the support group leader for the virtual chapter. Helen, welcome! Hello, everybody. <laughs> Happy Monday. Happy Monday to Eric and all you wonderful people out on the internet lands. It is going to be an awesome Monday. I'm like really looking forward to the talk tonight. I'm in a great mood. So let's get this thing rolling. <laughs> Perfect. Well, folks, at the beginning of every RFRX, we have a poll. And these poll, this poll has some questions that uh, is designed to get you in the mindset of what we're going to be talking about today. So we've got three questions this uh, this episode. And the first one is, have you felt like life has no meaning without religion or God? And we've got four answers. Yes, I currently do. Yes, I have in the past. Nope, I've never felt that way, or I'm not sure. Question number two, have you engaged in risky behaviors trying to test to see if God will intervene? Yes, I recently have. Yes, but it was a long time ago. No, I haven't, or I'm not sure. And the final question, have you experienced panic attacks or bouts of extreme sadness when you're driving near your old church? Yes, I recently have. Yes, but it was a long time ago. No, I don't, or I'm not sure. Okay, so tonight we are here for RFRX. This is an amazing show produced by Recovering From Religion. And um, this is where we bring on some amazing guests and talk about some topics that folks really who, who come to Recovering From Religion for help that they struggle with. Uh, and I mean, we have had near um, almost 13 years of experience where people are coming to us and we've got, I tell you what, we've got a spreadsheet full of these topics and issues. Um, we have covered issues ranging from like, hey, uh, I'm no longer a believer, but my spouse still is, my partner still is. How do we kind of work together? Um, I've got the sphere of hell. Uh, what do I do about it? Um, we've had some amazing discussions about a real specific religions like the Amish or Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, this has been a really great show for me to kind of learn how things uh, work. And, and um, I've got a lot of great stuff out of it. Um, uh, this is not at all a replacement for the support group meetings or for the online community or even for the helpline. Instead, this really kind of, this show really complements those different programs. Um, the guests here, they provide some fantastic coping skills and some great advice. If you have any questions or inquiries or comments, you can email us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And if you've missed any or um, a part of this discussion, you can watch it when it comes back onto our YouTube channel. It gets published there. Um, folks, we are in the 90s with the number of episodes that we've done. And so there is a ton of amazing shows that are um, all on our YouTube channel. And I'd really encourage you to take a look at uh, some of the past topics. We've had some great guests and some uh, really amazing discussions. Um, Helen, we've talked about, we've said the, the initialism RFR. What, what is it all about? Tell us more. All right. So um, RFR, in case you're all run, wondering, stands for Recovering from Religion. And basically, RFR, our mission state, statement is, is to offer hope, healing, and support to those struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. And how do we do that? So we offer, how do we offer hope, healing, and support? <laughs> we do it by people reaching out to us. So how do you do that? Well, if you go to our website, go to recoveringfromreligion.org, we have a helpline or, and this is where you can either call or chat in and you will be connected with one of our agents 24 seven. Um, and they are well-trained to just offer a sympathetic ear with no judging, no criticism to help you work through whatever issue that you're working through, whether it is getting along with, you know, religious family members, whether it's, you know, navigating certain um, teachings you were taught, you know, whatever it is that you're kind of dealing with in regards to religion, doubt, disbelief, we are here to help you. Whether you're just starting on this journey or you're 20 years out, um, we will help you no matter where you're um, looking for that support. 
Um, also, um, we have a resource page. So if you are looking for articles, videos, um, blogs, information on any sort of topic regarding faith, religion, um, this disbelief, um, doubt, all those different things, you can go to our resource page. And we have a whole bunch of books, articles, videos, all types of stuff on there. And the second part of this is the hope part. So the best thing you can do to find hope, and I've discovered this, is hearing other people's stories. That the when you are in a particular faith or mindset, like you know, and you want to connect with other people that are going through similar experiences, when you're going through those, um, you know, um, the those part those fans of doubt and uncertainty you want to hear good supportive stories of people that have gone through the transition and are uh, that can meet you where you're at and because we're all on this in this together so you can go to our blog on or to our podcast and um eric's going to put up the links for those as well and that's how you connect and find those stories that are going to help you get some hope back into your life and know that it's going to be okay in the end i know eric wants to talk about support because it's his favorite thing to talk about so you go ahead <laughs> oh my gosh thank you so much folks uh i give the co-host um, the opportunity to highlight whatever they want in the outline whatever they want to talk about and i am so grateful when they leave the support groups part for me because that's my favorite program of recovering from religion these are peer support groups. This is where we get to meet face to face, whether it's virtually over Zoom or in person um, and discuss and talk about and share what we're struggling with. Um, I've been a support group leader for six or seven years and it has made a huge difference on me. Not only being able to listen to other people's stories and learn uh, more about uh, how other people experience the world, but also for me to share what's been going on and have an empathetic ear to talk into. It's These just are, are amazing, amazing groups. We have 65 of these groups around the world, including two virtual chapters, one of which that Helen heads up, and the other one is a virtual chapter specifically for women or trans, uh, anybody who identifies as female or non-binary or gender fluid, they're welcome to you participate in the women's only virtual chapter. You can find the nearest one to you at um, um, our meetup page. I'm going to drop that link in the chat. In the chat. Um, we've talked about the helpline and we've talked about the support groups. Those are both peer support. They're not, uh, no one is professionally trained within the recovering from religion training to handle uh, professional treatment, but sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need more than what peer support can offer. So we have set up the Secular Therapy Project. This is where, uh, this is a directory where secular therapists are screened and vetted to ensure that they have the appropriately licensed in their state or the country to ensure that they maintain a secular practice. So you will not be um, need to run the risk of being proselytized to. I personally wasted a lot of time and money on a, uh, a therapist who based his therapy in a religious uh, doctrine, and it just wasn't what I needed at the time. And they're also vetted to make sure that they use exclusive use of evidence-based treatment. Um, you can check that out at seculartherapy.org and make an account and find a secular therapist near you. Now, we've also got a community aspect to uh, a, pr a program to Recovering from Religion, the Recovering from Religion online community. This is an online platform that is not at all publicly accessible, um, and, but you are able to meet with people who have similar backgrounds. If you're a member of the LGBTQ uh, community, or if you are an ex-Muslim or an ex-Mormon, or uh, if you've discovered you're now a secular parent, we have got channels in this Slack platform, the Slack workspace, where you can join and talk to people who have experienced the same things and have, may have some advice or some suggestions for you as well. If that sounds like something you want to do, head to recoveringfromreligion.org, connect with the helpline either by phone or by chat, and they'll ask you a few questions to see if you're a good fit, and they'll send you an invite. Um, speaking of community, holy cow, the Atheist Community Discord, they are amazing, folks. If you're looking for a community of non-believers and uh, just a fantastic discussions and events, 
check out the Atheist Community of Discord. They, right now, are super kind enough to be streaming this show into their Discord channel. And I've dropped a link into the chat. Helen, man, my mouth's getting dry. You want to talk to us about volunteering? Of course I do. Um, so those of you who have you know been around the block with us for a while have either like called into a chat line or been going to like these rfrx talks and you are like hey you know what i got some free time i want to get involved please consider volunteering with us we will find a home for you whether if you want to be an agent if you want to help eric edit videos <laughs> i'm still please. trying to help you find people <laughs> If um, if you're good with um, internet tech stuff, whatever it is, we will find a home for you. But um, I can say this, I've been volunteering for over a year now. And Eric's been volunteering for a while. Oh, Rob's been volunteering. Sasha has been volunteering for a while. all of our volunteers. Have, the ones that have been here for, you know, so for so long, it is way beneficial we i've learned good communication skills i've learned to become more sympathetic I, and i'm always taking in those skills and building on those and also to just the fact that i get to help somebody you know work through whatever shit that they're dealing with that day is a really rewarding feeling so if this is something that you feel that you would be good at that you want to get involved um, we would really appreciate you going to the website again filling out an application and get you started on that process we will be deeply deeply appreciated as we are always looking for volunteers and you get to work with me and other wonderful people which is great <laughs> <laughs> So, and moving on, um, on that topic, we have a fundraiser coming up. Um, this, it is hosted by Ethan Michael, your friendly neighborhood atheist. It, this is the second fundraiser that he is doing for us. He did one for us last year for his one year anniversary of being a YouTuber and he's doing it again. The, the fundraiser will be February 19th, stream 6 to 10 p.m. on YouTube on his channel. 100% of the funds that we raise go to recovering from religion and our, with the work that we do. So if you got $1, you got $1,000, please consider donating. You can donate right now. Um, but also please turn into the live stream and definitely subscribe to Ethan's channel because he is a wonderful person and I, we want to help support him as much as we can because because he's supporting us. Okay, Eric, let's move on to this thing with the show. Let's all get right, going. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we have just about wrapped up this whole intro stuff. I, um, I, I really appreciate you guys sticking around and listening to us talk about this. You know, we say this every single week because you and I, we're not in the same place every week. There may be something that you experienced over the last week that um, when we talk about the Secular Therapy Project or the helpline, it says, it reminds you, oh yeah, I really need to talk to them. I really have something I want to say and uh, get out. So folks, uh, that's why we do this every week. Um, but enough with that. Let's get on with the show. Folks, we're going to have a discussion with our fantastic guests. This is someone I have been waiting for, gosh, maybe nine to 10 months to kind of have on our show. I'm so excited to have him here. Now, when that's all wrapped up, we're going to bring on a new face that you haven't seen before, Jennifer Klassen, and she will be talking to us. Uh, she'll have a special message for us as well. Without further ado, it is my extreme pleasure to bring on Farron Wiley. For 42 years, Farron Wiley remained the uh, in the Christian faith through sexual abuse at the hands of clergy and carrying the traumas of being the focal subject of an evangelical church scandal. He is a longtime avid communicator, former pastor, and church musician. Apparently, Farron recently took a hard left in his positions on church and religion, prompting him to write the books Tabernacle of, of Lies and Californication, Memories of Memoirs of Innocent Lost, as well as his, uh, he hosts a podcast, The Worth Wiley Show. Farron says, we are all the victims of what we have been taught until we can just allow ourselves to learn something new and accept it. Farron, welcome to RFRX. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much. That was a powerful, powerful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was written by a fantastic writer, I gotta say. 
Baron, um, you contacted us uh, about 10 months ago, and it, I was so excited to bring you on. You're the author of these fantastic books. I haven't read them yet, but I did read the um, synopsis of them, and, and they just look really, really engaging. Um, where do you kind of want to start this discussion? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, again, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. And yeah, we did. I did reach out to you several months ago and I was just looking myself to try actually to find a uh, community and uh, connect with, you know, more people who might be going through the same things that I was at the time. Um, uh, I had uh, begun, of course, writing and I was looking for people to share my story with and uh, then I got this email back saying, we're closed. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but thankfully, um, you know, uh, you know, after things kind of settled down during uh, uh, COVID, uh, you were able to reach out to me, we were able to make this connection. And uh, through some ups and downs and technical difficulties, I am finally here, and I am thankful. <laughs> Hallelujah, <laughs> brother! <laughs> welcome, welcome to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that there are uh, a number of um, experiences that uh, I may that may resonate with viewers tonight, and I want to. Uh, you know, just take time and go through some of my own experiences. And by no means am I an expert in anything. Uh, I am, you know, here in in terms of the uh, the uh, uh, the tenets of the group. You know that you know by sharing our experiences that uh, we can uh, find and create pathways to uh, healthier states and uh, of mind and and living so that uh, um, we, we, we can move past things. And, you know, like I said, I was in the faith for 42 years and my entire identity yeah. was uh, connected to that. Mm -hmm. And in losing that piece, uh, it was, you know, actually more, more traumatic than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't realize how much uh, that of my personal identity, my emotions, my mental state was all tied into that. And um, uh, in, in letting it go, there was some rebuilding that had that had to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I, and so many people that we talk to and that come to RFR, uh, Recovering from Religion, feel the exact same way too. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's something, it's like, uh, hopping over the abyss we don't know what, where we're going to land we have no idea what to expect and uh there's just so many like we get blindsided so easily from the things that come up um now uh i would i am so interested in hearing your story but you've got a slideshow to help kind of uh tell us about that is that right yes yes and so just as a as a preface to that just before we get into that um uh just so ev everyone would know that i mean i grew up uh, uh, Pentecostal mm. uh, and um, believing in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Uh, um, I uh, came to the under well, not really even came to an understanding of what it meant to be saved, but I said the sinner's prayer at 11 years old. So I'm not sure, you know, that, you know, at 11 years old, you under really understand what you're doing, but. Uh, you know, went to Christian schools and, you know, all of the, the full-fledged indoctrination. Um, eventually, I came to the point that I considered myself to be a believer. Uh, so, um, uh, what you'll be getting tonight in the, in the slideshow is a little bit of a, fa is a fast forward. If you are interested in knowing more about the the sordid details of my childhood, you can get books. So, but, uh, uh, they, but they are uh, fascinating uh, to, to tell the tale. But all right, so uh, just by means of int introduction, first of all, I'm Farone P. Wiley. I'm the author of Mem Memoirs of Innocence Lost. And tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about strategies to rebuild a sense of self-worth, a self and self-worth after one's religious identity is stripped away and making rational 
uh, decisions about unhealthy behaviors in contrast with a sin consciousness. So as an overview, you know, I'll be talking a little bit about myself, sharing my experiences, some of the problems that I encountered, how that had an impact on my emotions and mental health. And we'll talk about some strategies to work through some of that stuff. And then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up after that for uh, uh, the Q&A session. Now, so hello. Um, Farron, you had... You said the, the phrase sin consciousness. Are you going to talk about that in your slideshow? Because that is just, to me, really struck and uh, struck me, that, that phrase. Yeah. So let me touch on it a little bit now. In, in that, and particularly having grown, grown up in uh, uh, Pentecostalism, uh, there was a heavy emphasis on staying out of sin and or staying out of a backslidden condition. Um uh, we were raised that, you know, the whole once saved, always saved was not a thing. Oh, uh, oh, really? Yeah. And so you could very well lose your salvation. And if you were caught in some kind of sinful activity and you happened to die before you were able to repent, uh, you could not go before the presence of God unclean. And so... We, 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 we lived under that. So we, we didn't get to go to movies. We didn't go dancing. We didn't get to do any of that stuff uh, for the, because we never knew when our ticket might be up. Right. And so it is, uh, it's that, I mean, that's a lot for an adolescent to take in let her, I mean, for an adult to take in, let alone an adolescent. Right. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> that was uh, very much a part of the culture uh, in the church that I grew up in. And there was always individuals, you know, you always felt like you were looking over your shoulder just in case somebody saw you doing something that you weren't supposed to be doing. So, uh, so yeah, uh, sin consciousness um, is the idea that uh, I'm making choices and decisions about my life uh, in order to be pleasing to God every day, uh, I, w I wake up, and if I had a if I had a dirty dream, uh, then I need to repent of that. If I if I was having a sexual thought, then I need to repent of that. Uh, if I stole the pencil, I need to repent of that. It was a constant state of uh, having to find myself or make altar somewhere, uh, and I'm I'm not sure how anybody. Uh, ever kept up with that they used to have a they used to have a saying in church during testimony time and the, the adults would would get up and say uh uh, uh I, I i just want to let you know that uh uh i've been serving the lord all day long and uh no sin and <laughs> i heard all day uh, all day and so I sit back, I say, well, it must be a nighttime thing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds exhausting, Farone. That was, that sounds just, if that's constantly on your mind, it sounds exhausting and borderline traumatic to me. It, it is, it is, it, 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 you, I didn't realize how exhausting it was. It, it was uh, until I got much older and, and further along i mean there were there were there were times when i thought uh it was during daylight savings time and i'd arrive at church earlier or whatever it is wh whatever the clocks went back and forth and nobody was in the parking lot and i thought that i had missed the rapture oh shit. oh wow <laughs> oh my gosh yeah i thought i thought that you know that you know jesus came and I, I miss church and, and that was it and so wow. that kind of that was those kind of mindset was very very wow. prevalent uh i think one time i walked into the church sanctuary and one of the tweeters and the speaker went out and it was letting out a low and i thought it was the horn the hor oh the <laughs> like trump. the seal one of the seals had been opened yeah. or something like that i thought it was the trump of the lord and uh 
and I fell to my knees and I was just like asking the Lord to forgive me. And so all of that. So when we talk about sin consciousness, that's, that's what I'm referring to. Man, I just want to reach through here and give you a big old hug. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm glad you missed the rapture, Baron. <laughs> I'm glad you missed it. <laughs> yeah, I missed it. But, um, but yeah, so I am Theron uh, uh, Wiley. I'm the author of Tabernacle of Lies and Californication. Uh, I'm an author and a musician and a podcast host. And so we'll talk about more about the books later, but the first two books in the series are available uh, right now at fwileymedia.com. And also Tabernacle of Lies is also available in an audio book that you can download from my website. Uh, but in advance of that, this will not move. There we go. All right, so I was formerly known as Pastor Byron Zeely or Pastor Z. Uh, after a long journey of overcoming the theological conflicts that were created between my sexuality and my spirituality, I jumped headlong into fulfilling what I believed were God's callings on my life. <clears throat> I had been the victim of childhood sexual abuse at the hands of clergy which you can read about and listen to in my books. <clears throat> but uh, fast forward, after completing sufficient observation and training, I was ordained into ministry in Dallas, Texas. I had also fulfilled a lifelong dream of recording a gospel album. I was, I was a pastor now. And that uh, most notably was the high point mm -hmm. of my life. Some of y'all might get the reference from the color purple. I was married now. But having <clears throat> been taught that everything happens for a reason, I assigned purpose to my own suffering because I couldn't oh, possibly believe gosh. that there was no way that God would let me go through all that for nothing. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I... I uh... That that struck me so hard. The uh, assigning purpose to your suffering, that seemed to be like the only way to make it bearable. Like I can imagine. Yeah, the idea that we, um, the idea that uh, we're taught that uh, God has a plan and has a purpose for everything, and even in. Uh, everything, uh, even in the bad things, we're taught to give thanks. And uh, for as much suffering as I had gone through, I could not fathom or possibly believe that that was for nothing. And so that God must have been preparing me for something greater and and that um, all, all of everything that was uh, going to be coming in my future was going to be, uh, it, it was all going to make sense once I was able to fulfill the plan of God on my life. And so much of this is just going to be my life in memes, but I was so happy to learn that I wasn't going to hell for being gay that I set out to be the best pastor there ever was. I was going to do it like Jesus did, or I was going to die trying. This was my moment, bitch. <laughs> I had never been more assured in my faith. And this is one of the memes I created. Once I had gained my confidence, God was finally going to vindicate me and show everyone he had not forsaken me. I'm black, I'm gay, I love Jesus, and I have no problem saying it. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> I, <clears throat> I hit the streets using every single one of my talents and resources to spread my newly restored faith. I was unstoppable telling everyone about the unconditional love of Jesus. In the house, I was compassionate to the poor and publicly fierce, challenging the hypocrisies of the church. This is one of the signboards that I had put up out of Matthew 5.32, Jesus said second marriage after divorce equals adultery. 
This sinful lifestyle is more rampant in the church than homosexuality. Why are adulterers allowed to preach, teach, and serve while gays can? Again, uh, challenging the uh, hypocrisies of the church, the, the church. God, today we pray for the rich and the well-to-do. Let them, despite the distractions of excess wealth, somehow find their way through the through the eye of the needle into the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, <clears throat> again, just because I am not living indoors does not mean I'm living outside of God. So Atmosphere of Praise, the church where I founded, was a church that ministered to people who were indigent uh, and living outside or drug addicted and those who were otherwise disenfranchised from mainstream church. We even had our own t-shirt. <laughs> that red. So you really think being gay means you can't be pleasing to God, honey? Watch and learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> uh, our church was uh, located in the uh, Cedar, Oklahoma Cedar Springs area of Dallas, which is known as you know, kind of boys town or the the gay uh, part of town. And often, uh, mainstream churches would come down and either protest uh, and <clears throat> or they'd stand out on the corner and sing worship songs and aim the worship songs at the club as if they were doing some kind of a, a spiritual intervention. And so uh, when I would see this happening, I would I, <laughs> I, I became a lot like um, uh, Cruella de Vil. I said, you know, release the deacons. Everybody go get their t-shirts on and we'd all stand out and we'd worship with the mainstream churches uh, with, with our t-shirts on and they'd turn around and they would wonder who this group of people was with them worshiping with them and then they'd read our t-shirts and be like, oh, oh, <laughs> these are the gay Christians. So uh, I was intentionally trying to meet force with force and be just as radical about preaching love as any evangelical group was about preaching hate. My entire identity was immersed in faith and doing the work of ministry. I was uh, the pastor. I opened up a GoFundMe page to help continue to feed and care for the area homeless. <clears throat> My entire identity, again, was immersed. Uh, uh, these are just some of the images of, of that period of, of my life. And this particular meme on the side is uh, one that I created at that time that, that kind of just demonstrates how I thought of myself. Your pastor, that very special person in your life that repeatedly puts up with your particular brand of crazy, the crazy your friends and family coworkers won't put up with, but the moment that he or she holds you accountable, you swear they're just like everyone else in your life. And this is just how I saw myself. There was this air of confidence uh, about who God had called me to be. I was determined to do it just like Jesus did it and without all the hypocrisy and oppressive doctrines of my upbringing. But there was seemed to be that I was, there was no way I could escape it. I broke, I spoke out amid many of the social issues in which the response of the church was profoundly inexcusable against gays, against uh, racism, against the oppression of women, uh, the idea that uh, uh, the Bible didn't con that somehow didn't condone slavery. Why was Jesus always white? Uh, Trayvon Martin and, and the hypocrisy in the church. I also held relevant celebrations and seminars to serve well the populations I believe God had sent me to. Uh, one was the AOP Gospel Divas Thanks for Thanksgiving Benefit Show. Uh, what the Bible says and doesn't say about homosexuality, God, sex, and monsters. We were trying to, uh, to uh, have conversations about what was uh, appropriate sexuality among uh, um, uh, New Testament believers. <clears throat> But this one particularly began a stir in the church community. It was the AOP Gospel Divas Thanksgiving Benefit Show. We decided to honor trans people who had lost their lives to violence 
by making the National Transgender Day of Remembrance a part of our liturgical calendar. We did so by holding a fundraiser that would include dinner and a gospel themed drag show at the church. It included numbers, uh, numbers from local drag performers and trans education and awareness talks. <clears throat> I even dressed up in solidarity. <laughs> you look so awesome. That's, that's great. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. I, I want to go to this now. <laughs> I want to go to this. this I would so, so go. Fun. There are videos available of the shows on YouTube. I can oh, that's them. awesome. <laughs> oh, yes. I will watch. I will watch that. <laughs> that is my oh. Jamie Jam Jam. <laughs> Uh, being that atmosphere of praise sir, served mostly indigent populations, tithes and offerings were not enough to support the ministry. <clears throat> I worked as a church musician in mainstream churches to earn income, and as I was paying for ministry primarily out of my pocket. Needless to say, the Diva Show uh, reached the church leadership of my employ. <clears throat> Wait, and so was, uh, you, if you don't mind me clarifying, you started your own church and you were doing these amazing things, uh, like you're doing the Lord's work as far as I can tell. <laughs> and then uh, in order to make ends meet, you had to go work at another church at, as a uh, music, as a um, uh, church musician, yes. Musician. And That's then so they heard about the drag show uh that that your the church you founded held is that correct correct okay so yeah we would uh, we 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 did not have church on sundays we had uh at my my church we we had church on tuesdays and fridays and we always served a meal and did a number of things to care for the people that were you know uh in our that were mm -hmm. in my care uh <clears throat> and so the diva show was one of those things uh and when we posted the video uh, on YouTube, uh, it began to circulate and eventually uh, came across the desks of the pastors of my employ. <clears throat> and I was unanimous, ugh, unanimously dismissed uh, from my positions as minister of music and told that my services were no longer needed as a result of my support of those who were living, quote, sinful lifestyles. So they didn't know about the ministry work you were doing at the time with well, your own with your own congregation or that that the, they just kind of like pretend like, you know, kind of pretended not to see. But then when it became too big to ignore, that's when they kind of kicked you out. <laughs> well, they were uh, I mean, it, it was no secret that I was pastoring a church, mm -hmm. uh, but they uh, never really came down there to see what was, you know, going on or. Oh, okay. So they, so uh, whatever information they had about what I was doing was what I told them. Uh, and, you know, yeah, I pushed the envelope a little bit and tried to have conversations and, you know, uh, particularly when they would uh, demand that I be a part of their Sunday school classes. And um, it was, it was kind of like just walking a tightrope. You know, you say just enough to keep your paycheck intact. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but once the video hit the hit the airwaves, uh, it started to circulate. <clears throat> and uh, because uh, pastors often travel in the same circles where it spread pretty quickly and I uh, became the face of gay church in Dallas, Texas, and no one would hire me. Mm -hmm. Oh. It was all good, though. I counted it all joy. Uh, Jesus said I would be persecuted. I still trust that I have heard from God. I still believe. I continued doing ministry, paying for it out of my own pocket. Only this time I was carrying the expenses on my credit cards, believing God would open the windows of heaven and oh, pull me out of bed. <laughs> Oh my gosh, just like looking at it from the outside, I could see this is not going good. Oh no. I bring this up for those who say, you must not have ever been a believer. I believed. 
I literally did what Jesus told the rich young ruler to do. And I was nowhere even near rich. I literally put my money on God. I mean, these guys were all constantly saying that was coming through for them. And all you have to do is trust him. Why not me? Needless to say, after all the fasting and praying and believing, the skies did not burst open and I was now roughly $10,000 in debt. Not only that, the tiny property where I was conducting ministry was sold out from underneath us with no heads up from God. Uh, no go to a place that I have prepared for you. And even after all this, I still believed. I created affirmations to keep telling myself God would not abandon me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this was one of the things I would I paste it on my mirror every day. I'd get up and say, and tell myself, I am God's child, and nothing can change that. God is using me, even when I can't see the results. God is pleased with me, even though I think I screwed up royally. God is cheering me on, even when I think all is lost. And one of my favorite, God sees when I'm obedient too. Uh, but a number of these, I would just keep this is where I'm at a point where I'm, I'm just trying to uh, reaffirm to myself that, uh, uh, that, that God is real and that he is a part of my life. And even further, uh, uh, again, my life and means. Uh, <clears throat> you, may, you may be one of the many who have abandoned church in reaction to the irresponsible actions of a highly publicized few. You hail your reaction as sound as a sound spiritual decision on your part, when in truth, you have only severed yourself off from God's divinely crafted masterpiece that is designed to heal itself by healing its own wounds, the body, that is the body of Christ. Now, that just sounds so profound. But even further on down the road, I'm beginning to lose hope. Even after all this, I still believed. And then this one, uh, I'm telling myself somewhere in 2014, God, I realize that if my 2014 is going to be any different, then my heart needs to be different. Mm. See how we all, it, always the blame is being put back. Right, right. So, uh, uh, my heart needs to be different. So Lord, I need a miracle before midnight because I know you're the only one who could change my heart i believe you're still a miracle working god so please god I'm begging now do it in me this new year's eve creating me a clean heart and a renew a right spirit within me this 2014 that miracle never came after all the prayer and fasting, the property where I conducted ministry was sold out from underneath us with no heads up from God. And eventually it was scheduled to be demolished to make room for condominiums. There wasn't time to find a new church building, but I had to move. Still believing and hoping against hope, I found a one bedroom apartment and continued to try to keep the ministry going. After all, Jesus died on the cross, allowing eight homeless and addicted people to sleep on my floor, feeding them with no income, and then constantly interrupting my sleep, using the only accessible bathroom that was in my bedroom, plus holding church and discipleship classes would be a cakewalk, right? Oh, fair in this picture. Uh, mm -mm. It's, it's your living room, and there's chairs set up like pews, and Yes. <laughs> I mean, what could go wrong? Oh man! Right? I, wow! I both uh, in this picture, it shows me both like the eternal optimism and hope, but also like this isn't gonna work. This is doomed. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that I'm like, that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> got the keyboard and the the pulpit. Oh my gosh. The, the handmade pulpit, like, yeah. And so then after church was over or whatever class I was teaching at that, we move all that stuff out of the way, 
and stack it up in a corner somewhere and lay out the the bed so people could sleep on the floor. Wow, I mean, I admire tenacity, like yeah, yeah. to keep to keep this, like like you know, you it's like on his last leg, like, you're like, nope, I'm not gonna give it up. I'm, I'm gonna make it work. work. <laughs> God's coming through. Oh, that's right. So I will be rewarded. Jesus loves me. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> right, right, right. <clears throat> so yeah, looks uh, like I'm miss, missing a slide there. Oh, and did I mention also breakfast with Jesus? You, <laughs> you broke pop tarts with Jesus. It, it was and like I, Jesus carrying on toast. I, said, I wasn't giving up. Right. I was going to rebuild the church by feeding the homeless handmade breakfast burritos and coffee in the park every Wednesday, teaching and praying for the sick and addicted. Hmm. The burritos are really good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did Tiffany ever show up? Did you get to have breakfast with her too? <laughs> and you have like Jesus. <laughs> Atmosphere of praise was my life. And with God's help, it was what I believed I would be doing until I died. Instead, now I was beginning to question whether God had a plan for me at all, other than to perpetually fall on my face and fail. Hmm. Eventually, my mental state began to decline. There was lots of crying and eliminating people from my household. I could no longer care for the people I loved with my minimal income. I couldn't keep going like this. I didn't want to live this way anymore. So I made a heart-wrenching decision to end it. There would be one last out the box jamboree in the park. I would give away as much as I could to those who needed it. And the rest went in the trash. Oh, oh, oh wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Baron, that picture of <laughs> like throwing away what you cared about so much and yeah. you had a passion of and just a pile. Oh, Oh, my heart's breaking, buddy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, I want to give you hugs. <laughs> it all went in the trash, Bibles, hymnals, chairs, and all. I was mentally and emotionally destroyed. Nothing mattered anymore. And eventually, after 12 years of clean time, I fell back on the only thing I knew how to do to numb my pain. I didn't feel like fighting anymore. I was exhausted and I was being evicted. I had no more rabbits in my hat. So what does a self-defrocked preacher do when he succumbed to temptation and out of options? He skips town under the cover of night before he has to face the music. <laughs> 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 It sounds just like Joseph Smith to me. <laughs> right? <laughs> or Ron Hubbard. <laughs> and starting over isn't easy. And when, you, when you've been doing church for as long as I had, you don't really end up with a lot of other marketable skills. So it was back to church I went. I went <clears throat> earning income as a minister of music. You know, uh, Farron, you make a fantastic point and about um, as a pastor, as a preacher, you don't have those skills necessarily to enter into the workforce and um, you know, sh shift careers. Um, we, we had the clergy project on here and, and they talked a lot about that as well. And uh, it's just, it's so real. <laughs> I'm really glad that you mentioned that too. Yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, I went back to working for a couple of churches and uh, uh, doing what I knew how to do, and I and I and I did it well. And but eventually, after learning that I had a strong grasp of the Bible, they started asking me to preach, and I did because I'm not an asshole, uh, but mostly because <clears throat> I didn't want to rock the boat, and I wanted to keep my coins intact. 
Um, but I no longer believed. I was back in the closet. The duality was eating away at me. And I had become everything I set out not to be. And my addictive habits were becoming more prevalent. So between uh, the time you lost the church um, and at this point you lost your faith in, 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 in a God as well? Well, it, the, my, the, my loss of faith was kind of a ongoing process. Uh, the, uh, the same courage that I, you know, had to employ to ask the hard questions about sexuality uh, was the same courage that I started asking other questions. And so while I'm trying to be the best pastor that I could possibly be, that includes studying the Bible, trying to understand what it's telling us and what God wants us to be doing. So while I'm studying, I am seeing all of these contradictions and horrible acts of God and, um, you know, children being torn to bits by bears and, 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 and the, the oppression of women. And I'm seeing, you know, God telling people how to own and beat slaves. And, and I am unable to reconcile that without just ignoring. But because of my upbringing, uh, it was the whole Bible. God said it, I believe it. And uh, now that I'm actually looking at it, there's, I am arriving at the conclusion that this cannot be the God that they told me about or that I was taught to believe was the benevolent savior of the world. And, uh, and so I'm praying and I'm asking God to, you know, is this you? And I'm not getting any answers. And, and so at the same time, I'm praying, you know, I'm seeing the things going left with the church and I'm asking God to come through and I'm not getting any answers. And um, so, yeah, that transition was, was, was kind of ongoing through uh, while, while I was pastoring as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And by the time I get to the end of it, I'm, I'm just, I'm outdone. I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm, I'm bewildered as to how I ended up here believing that this is what you told me to do in the first place. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, um, uh, after leaving town and starting to play for other mainstream churches, uh, and continuing to preach, even though I no longer believe, um, I am significantly back into another closet. And the duality was eating away at me. I were, had become, uh, the, I felt like I had become this hypocrite that I just never wanted to be. I wanted to, I wanted to be the guy that shattered the mold of Christian hypocrisy. And uh, here I was preaching to people and preaching stuff that I don't even believe. And my addictive habits were becoming more prevalent. And eventually I had to make a drastic decision for my mental health and sobriety. And I abruptly separated myself from religious environments altogether. And uh, Without getting into too much of the sordid details, uh, what? Well, I might as well. Uh, what? What? What ended up happening is I ended up getting so high that um, I was having a paranoid. Uh, I guess what I would describe as a paranoid breakdown. Uh, I thought uh, people were following me and chasing me in my car. Uh, so I pulled into the nearest hospital and uh, went through the emergency room so I could try to access treatment. 
Sounds uh, like we almost lost you, Karun. Yeah. Mm. And so uh, via several trips throughout the day, the mental health facilities uh, trying to seek treatment. So in the following weeks, I would experience anxiety, panic attacks, shortness of breath, extreme sadness, depression, crying for several days at a time. Uh, this was a, this, I, you know, I, I, I actually describe it as it felt like uh, that someone that I loved very much had died. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and that person was me. Um, I experienced the classic stages of grief, grief and loss. Uh, there was suicidal ideation. Uh, there was stress related diarrhea, uh, increased, uh, hypertension. So where are we now? We did, you know, we talked about my introduction. We sh shared some experience and problems things that were going on with my emotional health. And so I want to talk a little bit now about uh, some strategies. Uh, <clears throat> so we were talking about sin consciousness earlier. And so in my exit from faith uh, and having to reconcile the, that, you know, you know, if there is no God that I have to wake up and please every day, then there uh, is technically no sin that I have to be worried about. Uh, so now if there is no such thing as sin, I can do whatever I want, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and technically, yes, you can. You technically do whatever you want. You can, you can be who and whatever you want and there are no limitations except your own self-respect and the respect that you have for others and your environment and, of course, the law of the land. <clears throat> you goddamn no... heathen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there, are, there are no eternal consequences <laughs> for your choices that we know of. <clears throat> now, you can quit your job and party and do all the drugs and live on the streets, saw off your leg and become a one-legged prostitute if you want to. However, uh, many Christian dogmas will assume and have you believe that walking away from faith automatically defaults to amorality. And this is not the case. In the process of redefining yourself, you also have the opportunity to define your personal morality. And for that's, me, that, go ahead. That's that's the really scary part, especially when, for, for me, it was so scary to do that because uh, where do we start? <laughs> There's so many, it's such a huge thing. Yeah. And so for me, my morality consists of one, respect for self, respect for others as they respect me, respect for my environment, and respect for society at large. However, respect for self is what I want to focus on first because I really can't, I, I can't get any further until I can figure that out. This is the top of the list. I love yeah. it. Uh, in my case, Christianity robbed me of my self-worth and taught me <clears throat> what I now consider to be a false pathway to joy. It was an acronym. They said, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. I now consider this to be a false pathway. Uh, <clears throat> the idea that joy is supposed to be our default emotion, no matter what happens, conflicts with natural human expression. Because sorrow is a part of life. Uh, anger is a part of life. And to deny ourselves these emotions is physically and mentally unhealthy. You can look up the effects of stress on the body to see how holding stuff in uh, can impacts your health. 
But giving yourself permission to feel the full spectrum of human emotions is liberating and can promote your overall health. <clears throat> so eating healthy, uh, these are, are all some, these are all some things that I have had to consider in the last two and a half years uh, and actually learning how to do them for myself in context of, uh, as, and rather in contrast to necessarily doing it to please God. So eating healthy, uh, exercising. Now, you, you know, I, I, if I would have considered trying to do yoga as a Christian, they would have probably took me to the altar. <laughs> Pharaoh, uh, in, in, in the city I came from, we have a giant church, uh, Assemblies of God Church, and one of the people wanted to teach a yoga class, and they're like, no, it's not yoga, you can't have yoga here, <laughs> and so they ended up turn, doing the exact same thing, but calling it stretching with Christian music, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna invite the demons in if you do yoga so let's just stretch and do <laughs> i remember as, i remember as a catholic but they said like meditation was going to be letting the devil in <laughs> you know where you're just like sitting quietly and trying to like just let your thoughts thoughts float by it's like the devil's going to get you he's going to affect your brain <laughs> <laughs> So, right. Well, we, I mean, we, we call it stretching with Jesus. Stretching with Jesus. <laughs> so, yes. Taking Jesus a wants long... to go. You want to go into downward dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Uh, taking a walk, cycling, swimming, you know, pretty much anything that's going to help get, 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 get your brain oxygenated. Uh, <clears throat> sleep is your friend don't neglect your friend uh i had to get past the idea that um I, I there was that one scripture that was always beat into my head about a little more folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like an armed man uh and this idea that we have to push through uh and endure our pain or even push it to the side uh, when sleeping is a very healthy and healing process. Uh, and uh, I found that, you know, uh, it has become more of a coping mechanism. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it works. So don't neglect your friend. Sleep is your friend. Uh, uh, I found myself uh, making lots of short-term goals that contribute to that contributed to my long-term. Oh, goals. that's beautiful! Oh my gosh, <clears throat> that's that's yeah. fantastic. I made lots of short-term goals, things that were obtainable, things that I could, you know, accomplish, and, and that I could actually put on my calendar and and say I actually got that done. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> And so, like when it came down to uh, 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 writing my books, um, you know, because that was a real pivotal and transitional point, uh, <clears throat> I had lost all of my electronic copies. I actually started writing these books back before I became a pastor, and I was so excited about all the things that were happening that it was my intention that I was going to write my tragedy to triumph story and how Jesus fixed everything. <clears throat> but ultimately, you know, life continues to happen. And uh, the, the story is having a very different ending uh, now. <clears throat> but uh, I, uh, through homelessness and through addiction and whatnot, I lost all of my electronic copies. I had only printed out one, um, uh, hard copy <clears throat> and I didn't really have being published uh, on, on my radar I let somebody read it and of course they encouraged me oh the, oh God's gonna get the glory and you gotta you gotta put this out there this is an amazing story and <clears throat> and so well yeah some 15 years later <laughs> I finally get around to it uh, 
but uh, of course I only have this one printed copy and I was like, I don't really, I, I don't feel like typing all this over. I don't. Um, so, but I did figure out how to, um, and that was one of my goals. I said, I, I'm going to figure out how to turn this text into editable text without having to type this over. So I figured out how to take pictures of the pages that I had and I uploaded those into Google Docs and it converted it back into editable text. So I didn't have to type it all over again. To, uh, smart, 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 smart. Uh, so I did spend the better part of 2018 and 19 fixing on it, rewriting what I had to and editing and getting it to, you know, to where I was comfortable you know, uh, publishing. Uh, but yeah, uh, making lots of short-term goals uh, that contribute to your long-term goals and, and put them on your calendar. Uh, financially, start learning how to pay yourself first. Yeah, yeah. What What would happen now if you took that 10% and just put it in a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, start tithing to yourself. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to no. pass yourself the dish to put your. <laughs> well, now you can just go in your bank account and transfer it. <laughs> Open up a separate savings account and transfer 10% to yourself. Thank yourself. Uh, just call it just call it like your Eric Church fund. <laughs> like the Church of Eric fund. <laughs> or swear to her, just intentionally swear to put Right. <laughs> and as with anything, you're 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 gonna have your moments when you feel like you're not making progress. But give yourself a break. I mean, you know. I, I have had to learn how to give myself a break because I've I've been living for forty some odd years like a twisted up knot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to learn how to let some of that stuff go, uh, it, you're you it's it's in all in all the stuff that I have been through now. Every, you know, I I can't attest. You know, my story isn't as tragic as some others you know some people have not gotten as, as far as you and i have and some of them are, are not here anymore because they maybe they weren't able to give themselves a break or maybe they thought that leaving was their break yeah. but give yourself a break you know take a breather you know um you know things have a way of working themselves out uh and listen to your listen to your body this 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 kind of touches back on this idea of having to push through everything and having to endure and this idea that we have to be uh strong and we got to make it if if i'm tired i'm going to sleep <laughs> if i'm sick i'm going to lay down you know uh and and sometimes if i just don't want to do it i'm not going to do it um <clears throat> But uh, listen to your body and 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 ch and cherish that. Give your body what it needs so it can carry you on to the next thing. Yeah, that's oh, such good advice, man. <laughs> I still need to. I need to look at this again just because I'm not following all of these, and I should be. I really want to uh, learn new skills. TikTok is amazing. Uh, I, you know, I'll get on there. I'll see stuff that people can do and I'll just keep watching it over and until I figure it out. But uh, uh, learning new skills and keeps your mind uh, fresh and, and, and sharp. And um, sometimes some of the skills that you already have, you might need to set down. And this is what I wanted to touch on. Um, I, uh, I, I, for the most part, I am a skilled piano player and, and musician. I'm not the best musician in the world, but I was pretty good at it. I was enough to get paid for. So mm -hmm. uh, now that's, I do not remember not having that skill, even as a child. 
So this may have been a one of those things that they call a gifting or whatever that you know it was that whenever I sat down to the piano, I was able to play something. So that became such a part of who I was. I thought that that was what I was called to do. Uh, however, um, in separating myself from religious environments, I discovered that that talent or and that ability, I was not able to express it in the same way. It, it felt awkward to sing about anything else but Jesus. Oh, I see. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to write love songs and dance songs, and it just feels like it's just not quite there. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to, you know, just put out anything. Um, and so, um, yes, it's been a while. And, and so I noticed that that particular emotion was starting to really af ne negatively affect me because, you know, I like playing and singing. I like doing it. Um, but I kind of had to set the piano aside. Yeah. For a while. Now, this won't, uh, I, I'm sure it won't be the last time I sit down. Uh, the urge will come come to me to, to, to write something. Something will inspire me. Something, uh, you know, I may fall in love or something may happen that will send me send me back to that that skill. But if I notice something that I'm that is in my normal routines that is messing with my head, identify that thing and maybe just set it aside it's not it doesn't have to doesn't mean that you're abandoning it it just means you're putting it over here for for a minute just for your mental health and just to to not have to dwell on stuff that was that you view as negative i say pick your battles love uh, it love pick it your, pick your battles <clears throat> you know but pick some you know, you don't want you you don't want to be overly stressed out, always having to argue with people about your choices to walk away from religion and and, and faith. Uh, however, picking some is appropriate. Right. Your ability to articulate your position helps to build confidence, but you don't need to constantly be in battle. Oh, oh this speaks to me so much. Like. I love it because um, the, I had no confidence when I first came out of it because I couldn't defend my position. And then the more and more I began to learn, I was starting to argue with everybody and like, hey, bring it on, I can take it. But then it was exhausting. It was exhausting. And now uh, this very sage advice of picking your battle is, is definitely reduces the amount of stress that I have in my life. That's perfect. Yeah, because I can't, you know, I guess I'm pretty much at a stage right now where it's like, mm, there, you know, I'll see something on Facebook and I just, I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut and I just, <laughs> I just want to say so. Uh, <laughs> and there's just, you know, there are so many opportunities to say stuff. There's always going to be an opportunity to say stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I just kind of check my motivations with that. You know, am I really just trying to pick a fight or am I, or, is this something that is going to actually have an, uh, a societal impact? Or if, or if I'm really, if I just really care about this person and I want to try to help them think differently about something, you know, yeah. you know, <clears throat> uh, because you, 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 there, are, there are enough opportunities for you to, you know, get, get in the mix and, uh, there's always going to be somebody who's going to be a little bit smarter than you uh, in terms of being able to, uh, uh, you know, articulate their, their arguments. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and I, I, I am personally not going to be spending any time trying to write any more thesis. You know, I understand, I, I understand enough uh, that uh, I can uh, have a conversation with someone and allow it to not to become overly contentious. So again, uh, give yourself a break, find 
community. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Perfect. Find community. And this seems to be a fine one, you know, to start. And it has lots of little offshoots where you can uh, find people, find people to talk to. Um, yes, there, there is, you know, there, there is a, the idea of finding com community, it works, it works both ways. Um, you know, pretty much that's what church is. Yeah. You know, church is community. You're finding like-minded people who share similar experiences. Uh, and now you're having to separate yourself from a particular community because you realize it is harmful to you. Uh, and people don't always, you know, church folks don't always react well to that because they don't like to examine what might be wrong with them. Yeah. And that's what someone's, that's what separation does. It, it just makes everybody having to have, have to take a hard look at why this is happening. And some people's reaction to that is not, um, loving or pleasant uh and sometimes it's defensive and oh uh, and we need to find community that is nourishing uh to where we are in life right now you make an excellent point and um so so often the religious community is so insular if there are interests like a book club or hiking or Christian stretching, Jesus stretching. <laughs> then they will, stretching they will for have Jesus. That. Yes, stretching for Jesus. <laughs> and they will have that within the religious community. But you don't have to be a part of a religious community to find people who like hiking, to find people who like yoga or or uh, creating art or, or knitting or something like that. There are those individual communities that may not have any other community in common. That's... Uh, so it's it's kind of cool <laughs> to be out of it. The world is so much more accessible now. And so, yes, um, you know, ce celebrating your progress. You know, that's why I say I talked about setting setting the the short term goals. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'm always uh, making a big deal out of you know. It, let me put it this way. As fucked up as I was just two years ago <laughs> uh, and could not get out of bed, did not want to uh, talk to people. All I wanted to do was use and not feel anything. Um, I have to uh, pat myself on the back. Oh, yes. Uh, so I have to, I have to look at my accomplishments of becoming a published author. I have to uh, look at my accomplishments of getting my credit score back over 700. I have to, I have to, I have to, to, in the same way that I was trying to convince myself to believe, I have to give myself some new tapes to play. Uh, and because if this is it, and, and there is no other, there is no heaven, hell, or afterlife after this, the value of the rest of my life just went way up. Yes. Yes. And mm. so um, every moment counts. Every birthday counts. Every mm -hmm. uh, weekend counts. Every, you know, it all counts. It, it, all, it all matters. And so... Um, <clears throat> so, Farron, uh, Farron, when you were when you got yourself clean um, as a Christian, you know, the, like 14 or 16 years ago or so, uh -huh. who did you give the credit to back then? Uh, I did give it to God. Um, but it was almost like reflex. Right. Um, I, in, in hindsight, it was like reflex. But what I recognized about myself even then was that whole concept of 
when you put your mind to something, you can do anything. Mm. And I noticed that I, I had less um, cravings to use when I was in a relationship. I had less cravings to use when I was pastoring. I had less cravings to use when I was doing weight loss. You know, whenever I had my mind on something else, I was not really focused on right. getting high or, or my pain or whatever the, the triggers were. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, in, 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 the, and in this last round, uh, you know, plunging myself into becoming a published author and a podcaster and cult and, and, you know, moving all of these different, uh, grabbing hold of all the, or should I say building all of these new identities within myself, things that I didn't know I really had the ability to do, uh, I am totally focused. And it's in that recognition that all this time that I've been asking God to do stuff, it's really been me doing it all yes. along anyway. Mm, yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, that's, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Yes, I, I think that's one of the things that kind of gets me when someone like thanks God for like their sobriety or they thank God that they got the right job or, you know, and I'm I'm over here like, no, you did that, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> you did that. Was like, be here. proud of yourself and your abilities and the work that you did. Like you did the work, <laughs> you know, like and I, I wish people would give themselves more credit and and more pride into the things they've accomplished instead of giving it over to their um non-existent sky daddy <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah and um that idea that i that 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 thought process has given me a lot more courage um and self-confidence um because yeah, I mean, and, and and I was even sitting sitting up during those years when all this I was praying and nothing was happening. It was because I was expecting God to do stuff. Yeah, and and the fact that I, and I was heartbroken that He wasn't. I was like, why do you not consider me special enough to do this? Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, everybody, you know, everybody else is special. Why can't I be special? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like God uh, went out for cigarettes and never came back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so I make this other point. It's never so celebrate your progress. Uh, it's never too late to change your mind. And I say that change your mind forward, not backwards. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> many of the traits that you already possess are still a part of who you are. I talked about the talents and the skills and the piano playing. Uh, innate versus learned behavior. Some things, uh, some abilities that we have, there's not, not, never been a time when we, we, we remember that we didn't have that. Uh, and, you know, that could still be a part of positively propelling your life forward. Uh, uh, some some of the some of that stuff is learned behavior, like we were talking about just a moment ago, about giving God, you know, thanks for stuff that you did. Um, <clears throat> identify which of those are most helpful or harmful to you. We talked about that in the example of the piano playing. Right now, I can't do music because. Um, there's nothing that's inspiring me right now. Yeah. And where, where Jesus was my inspiration, that's not happening. And I cannot sing passionately about uh, tuna fish. So. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, my value of myself went up in recognizing that I only have one life to live. And uh, I began writing so I could leave my mark on this world and probably have something to survive myself. 
And uh, again, music was my passion for a long time. However, my skills were and so entrenched in the worship of Jesus, I found it awkward trying to sing and play about anything else as the passion was not there. <clears throat> I may get there again, but one day, one day, but for now, I have had to let it go. Writing, however, has been a way for me to reinvent myself apart from my Christian identity and has served as a catalyst for my emotional healing. Barone, you're being so kind to yourself. Uh, this is just, this feels so comfortable and I'm so glad you're saying this stuff. <laughs> So Farone P. Wiley would emerge as the identity that I would pursue to rebuild healthier sense of self apart from a practice of any faith. I figured if trans people have, have, can, can make an identity change, so can I. Uh, if, and I. If I need to change my name to do that, to protect the guilty, <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my journey is by no means over, but I hope that if this presentation has helped you in any way, that you will continue to explore and unpack the best version of yourself. A healthy respect for oneself is the beginning of interacting with others and our environment in ways that are beneficial. Of course, I wish you, you if you wish to engage my backstory more extensively, I'd be honored to have you as a reader and a listener. You can always engage my work online at fwileymedia.com. Both of my print books and the Tabernacle of Lies audiobook are available at fwileymedia.com plus the Worth Wiley Show podcast and selections of some of my original music. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and I do my best to answer my emails and instant messages. Thank you so much. For this. Thank, Sarah, you. thank you. Thank you. This is awesome. great. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, um, folks, I have dropped uh, the links to um, uh, Farone's website as well as uh, links to his books in the chat. Um, so take a look at those. Oh, this was so good. I'm looking at the chat here and for own so many people have just uh, talked about how positive this has been for them and so mm -hmm. grateful that uh, they heard what you had to say. So thank you. Awesome. I'm trying to get back over to see you people. <laughs> my, my, <laughs> well, computer we're won't, my computer won't. Uh... All righty. Well, okay. um, we have got a selection of questions from mm. the audience. Um, you feel ready to go into that? Yes, go ahead. Helen, you want to take the first one? Sure. Um, are you still in touch with friends and members of your church community now that you have left? Uh, I have limited communication with uh, individuals from my church. Um, <laughs> Basically, when anybody contacts me for, you know, who was one of my parishioners, it's usually, it's usually because there's some crisis going on. And so I have a few people that, you know, still want me to be in that role for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can, uh, it can, it can be challenging to, to, to navigate. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, like one particular individual, um, he considered himself very close to me. And when he reached out, he was, you know, hey, pastor, hey, pastor, hey, pastor. I said, well, I'm really not anybody's mm -hmm. pastor anymore. Mm -hmm. But I still didn't want him calling me by my first name. So I, <laughs> I said, just call me dad. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did that, but, uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in contact with a few people, uh, but uh, not, not, not so much anyone who, uh, who was involved with my ordination process or uh, anybody who hired me. Uh, I kind of just broke those ties. Got it. Mm -hmm. Um. You kind of answered this question. If you needed yeah. to, would you still work as a church musician? 
Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Answer uh, asking the hard questions here on R. That's right. <laughs> you know, um, I I have flirted with it, um, and so there there was there was a time when m m money was that low where I just said I just maybe I need to do this, but I. <laughs> Everybody's um, got a price. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, when you were kind of going through this dark period, did you ever feel like you wanted to fall back onto some uh, religious thinking or actions or returning to the church? What was that? Um, uh, and, and if so, how did you kind of handle those 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 feelings or reactions? I I, I never wanted to go back, I, and I and I think I've I've kind of been that way about most things in my life. It's like if I if I break up with you, I'm probably not going back. <laughs> We're probably not ever going to get together <laughs> again. But uh, I mean, we could still be friends, sort of. But um, <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I guess I went uh, through enough of that back and forth in my head uh, previously about, you know, uh, well, this is, this, is, this is happening in your life because you don't want to, uh, you, you're not serving God. Hmm. Um, but I, as an adult, I never, you know, either I, I kind of believe that, you know, either Jesus loved me or he didn't. And either Jesus died on the cross and he or he didn't. Uh, so I didn't really have a whole lot of that back and forth thinking. So even now, um, the truth is. The rational choices that I have been making have put me in a better mental, physical, emotional, and financial position than I've ever been in my life. Oh, yes. So um, I've never been this financially stable. I mean, I'm not rich, but I'm, I'm, I've never just never been in a place where I didn't have to feel like I was going to have to do something crazy to make some money. Um, and because I've applied certain principles in my own, own life that had nothing to do with give and it shall be given unto you, which I've never seen that ever manifest in, in my own life. Um, right. Uh, now, people have been kind. Mm -hmm. Uh, and people have donated, um, but it was never to the degree that I thought um, that this was something that God did. Right. Because I believed, you know, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men heap into your bosom. And that, I, you know, that language says, I, I really don't got to worry about nothing. I mean, I can, I can, I can, I can give everything I have away, and God, and God's got me. Mm. And that did not happen. That at least not in the way that I expected that it would, and to that I would expect for somebody who was being obedient. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I so no, that. I don't want to. I don't. Right now, things, uh, things are pretty good. <laughs> So I don't really have a desire to go back. Got it. Helen? Can't say I blame you. <laughs> anyway, um, so kind of, um, you mentioned that, you know, you had started like a gay ministry and um, that sort of thing. Um, do you find that many churches are now becoming like gay friendly or do you find that like there's still a lot of objection going on? Um, to the gay community and, and um, church leadership and stuff like that? Uh, I still think that the objection is, is pretty prevalent. 
Um, um, I would I would say that in in well in black churches it is still a a bone of contention, mm-hmm. and that if it is uh, um, if you're there, you better not say nothing. Right. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it, it, but I I don't know uh, you know in in terms of uh, if if we're talking about drawing you know the the, the racialized church is still the, the most segregated you know place uh, mm-hmm. in, in the world, but um, there is a broader uh, acceptance I would say in, in white churches. Um, but it's still pretty much kind of a don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you're not going to necessarily be able to serve in any kind of ministerial capacity um, you, a, attached to someone of the same gender uh, or, or, or being, uh, uh, if you are one that is uh, theologically proclaiming that um, uh, homosexuality is not an issue, you know, for God. Mm-hmm. Uh, now there are some de- denominations where it's not an issue, but I would t- I would say predominantly in mainstream uh, churches, it's still it, it, it's a no go. Do you, do you think like the MCC is a good alternative if for people that are you know you know in the queer community for an alternative for um, to get involved in a church? Do you think that's a good alternative for people? Uh, I still uh, encourage people who are um, believers and who are gay. I still point them to affirming ministries. Mm-hmm. I just want them to be in the safest mental space that they can that they can be. Right. Um, and so when they so if someone who is gay who is a believer and they are looking to understand, you know, that they're not going to hell, uh, I, that's the first thing out of my mouth is not going to be just I believe. You know, I'm gonna to try to do baby steps. Right. You know? <laughs> um, but that might be too much for them to to, to chew. You know, at, at that moment. So uh, I have a website. Well, not well. It's not my website, but a website that I still use, uh, which is www.mercytoall.net. Uh, and that has a pretty exhaustive um, breakdown of the clobber passages in the Bible that uh, um, can kind of walk someone through who's 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 gay to understanding uh, those those passages for themselves. And I will often use that website as as a as a as a referral. Uh, to to refer people to who are on that particular journey. Okay. And I've dropped that link into the chat. Well, um, uh, Farone, this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Before we move on to the conclusion, do you have any, I um, can't think of how you could possibly top what you said, but I'm sure you will be able to. Do you have any closing thoughts uh, before we before we start the conclusion. So I, I just I just want to say that this is this has been amazing for me too. I um I was worried I didn't have enough. I was like <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I um this this is ex- exciting and I'm hoping that each of you will uh be able to hold a grab a hold of something. Yeah. Uh, and if you want you know, you know, some kind of, I don't know how, if there's a transcript of this or something like that, or, or if you even, yeah, I'll just, I'll send you the, 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 the uh, PowerPoint if you want. I don't care. You can... 
<laughs> oh, that's a great but, idea. Yeah. 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 You can uh, shoot me the PowerPoint and then I'll get a link to that and put that in the YouTube channel for sure. Okay. But Thank yeah, uh, any, any, it, it, if anybody is able to grab something from my story that's helpful and helps them to move uh, in a positive direction, that was my whole intention for tonight. Well, you did that for more than just one person, because I know you did it for me, and so many other people in the chat uh, got a lot out of it, too. Um, uh, and then if you have any email, any uh, topic suggestions or questions or comments or inquiries, you can send them to RFRX at recoveringfromreligion.org. Helen, tell us about the social media part. Yes, so uh, we are all over the social medias. If you want to check out anything that we're doing, we have our blog that you can um, find out more about the support stories and um, the benefits of recovering from recovering from religion. So please visit our blog. You can also see our um, former episodes of our podcast that is also available online. And you can follow us on all the social media. So please do. We are on the Instagram. We are on the Twitter. We are on the TikTok. We are on the Facebook. Please like, share, subscribe. Please come visit those pages and find out about all the wonderful things that we are doing at Recovering From Religion. Also, too, um, we have a Facebook support group. Um, so those of you that need a little bit more support during um, the month when you're not going to our virtual support groups, please go check us out over there. Um, all of our events are on the Twitter machine and on the Instagrams and the TikTok of things that we have coming up. And you can check in with all the wonderful people that work at RFR. Also, if if you want to keep up up to date on everything we have going on, please sign up for our newsletter. Eric put a link in that in the chat. So if you want to get even more information about what's going on, a little articles and things like that going on with RFR, please sign up for our newsletter. And I am out. I did my <laughs> social media shilling. Folks, this has been another fantastic, I promised it at the beginning, and I pulled through. It's it has been another fantastic episode of RFRX. Mm -hmm.